Welcome back to the Heal with Gold show. I am so excited. Today I am beyond because Fally. I when I was promoting the show, I was telling everybody, Fally is probably the wisest woman I know, the most inspirational woman to me. Um, the way she talks, the way the examples that she brings, everything comes to life in a way that I can feel it, that I can see it, that I can absorb and that I can remember and that I can understand. So it's such a treat to bring Fally back. But before I do, and uh, before I tell you a little bit more about Fally, I just want to remind everybody that this is a part of the 10 series, uh, a, a, a one part out of the 10 um, that we're doing in memory of Miriam Amsalem. So I hope that her neshama has an aliyah. And just to remind everybody that we are going through each of the golden nuggets in the Heal with Gold book. And because I want everybody to have access to this information, I made the Kindle version at 99 cents and the paper bag is $9.99. You can get it on Amazon and you can follow the chapters with the classes that we're bringing here. Today, Fally is going to bring about time. What does it mean in the process of healing? How can we use time effectively to help us in this healing journey? Um, because it's not just about letting it pass. Uh, I see some of you are here. Please say hi, state your names. You will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end, but feel free to participate. And without further ado, my good friend, Sally Klein. Hi. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> I have your book right here, right here. It's sitting right next to me. <laughs> uh, I'm so happy that you're here. Um, beyond every moment that I have with you, I cherish and I feel I feel like I'm privileged that I'm getting such a gift from you, your wisdom, all our texts back and forth. And by the way, for everybody who is here, and I'm just going to tell you, hi, Gina, nice to see you. I just want to um, to tell you, those who don't know how I met Fally, because this was the biggest blessing and how it happened was so special to me. So some of you may know that I have a fashion line. I'm a fashion designer. I don't see myself as a fashion designer. Such a weird title. But I have a fashion line. And I received a message from Fally describing to me how the clothing that I design supports what she does in her retreats. And it was an 11 minute long message that re I cried so much. I was sobbing like, like, <laughs> ugly crying so i had to text her and i had to say hold on i'm crying too hard i can't see the keyboard to answer and and that it was the way that the the relationship was born i'm telling you that because you guys are communicating with people online and meeting people online don't take those relationships for granted work on them you don't understand what can be born from from those friendships so she is my gift, and I bring her to you, uh, Fally. We are talking about time. Yeah, and, and it's I, funny how you talk about time, and you just reminded me that I sent you an 11-minute voice note. That was more like a podcast. Like, time is very relative. I'm telling you, what they, those were 11 minutes um, that changed how I work because so often the work is so hard and so often i told you many times that i feel that i'm voiceless right i feel that i don't have a voice that that i don't reach people so there's moments that i say what am i doing why am i doing this and and you told me uh, uh, i'm gonna tell you what uh, a little bit of what sally said and probably the part that i cried the most sally said you know one day you will die and go up to God and you'll meet him and you're not going to understand the place that you walked into because you have no idea 
how what you do impacts other people. And then she explains how my clothing impacts her retreats and the women that she sees. I bring this up to you because we have no idea how we impact people. We have no idea how the messages that we're sharing can change somebody's life. Every time that I feel like quitting, I think about that message. I listen to it many, many times because it gives me the, the, the strength to keep going and the belief that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So share this video. You know, go now, wherever you are, share, because you don't know who you're going to introduce Fally to. Me, and, you. Yeah, no, Fally, and change their lives, because I'm giving you the mic right now. <laughs> Fally, take it from here, please. I remember, I remember when I sent that voice note, and every time you share this story, it's actually really validating for me, because I, I'm like an introvert at heart. Uh, not at heart, I'm actually an introvert and people don't believe me because I do so well on stage and on screen and extroverted, but really I'm, I'm shy. I know people are like, what, you're shy? I am. And I thought a thousand times before reaching out to you. I, I sat on it and I sat on it and I sat on it. And I remember that the moment I decided to reach out to you, I was just off one of my three day intensives. So I had not slept in about uh, four days. I was overtired. I was supremely emotional. And I just made this impulsive move. I'm going to text you now because in a day or two, I'm going to let that that impulse settle and I'm not going to do it. And I was so glad I did it. And I remember just I remember where I was. I was actually in my closet. <laughs> I was I walked into my closet. I have a you know like a walk in closet and I was talking to you in my closet and I was pacing. I was just pacing like it's two steps. It's not that big of a closet, but I was pacing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth as I was texting to you. And then I realized that it was about 10 minutes. And I, I think I even apologized to you on the voice note that it was so long. And then I just hit send. And I said, I like, and I was like, I hope I didn't just embarrass myself. And, um, and it really taught me such a, it's such a huge lesson. You, you can't, you can't do that enough. You know, you can't um, compliment people enough, acknowledge people enough. And what's the worst that would have happened? So what? So you wouldn't have responded. You wouldn't have, you know, but I, I, I learned such an important lesson. And when some, when someone pops into my head or I do get an urge to, to reach out to someone, check in on someone, compliment someone, ask someone how you're doing, what does it cost you? Send a text. I don't even pick up the phone. It's not even a phone call. I don't even invest that much, but sending a text um, and you really can change people li people's lives that way. Yeah. And Sally, I have to tell you, you just said that and it kind of freaked me out that this happens a lot with you. Because Miriam Amsalem, the one that we're doing the show for, she was in my mind for two, three weeks. And I kept saying, I need to text her because she introduced me to a chiropractor because I was really not feeling well. And that chiropractor introduced me to a functional medicine doctor who is now treating me. And I, there is no question that he saved my life, that I was very close to a heart attack. And Miriam was the catalyst for that journey of physical wellness and I started feeling better and I wanted to text her and I wanted to tell her thank you so much like you have no idea that you introduced me to this person and this person introduced me to somebody else who saved me and I literally was saying okay by Tuesday I'm for sure texting her and Friday she had uh, an aneurysm and Saturday night she passed away so young, so sudden, so many things unsaid. So when you're saying about, you know, we all want validation, we won't all want that message. Like we don't know how we can impact somebody's life by by telling them what they are bringing into to the world. Um, but time is of the essence because time is not promised. Tomorrow is not promised. And what we do with the time here on earth is what matters, right? It's not just a matter of time passing. We talked about, um, let's just say hi, hi, Paul. Uh, it's not um, just about the time will pass and because time will pass, it will heal, but it is also what you choose to do with this time. So please. 
Yeah, there's so much to say on time. I know we spoke a little bit before we even got on screen, like, are we good? Do we have what to say? And it's just like, Miriam, we have lots to say. Uh, we'll never we'll never finish talking about this, but I think to start with this point is a really, really good one. One of the things that I work really hard on is when something pops into my mind, I don't push it off. I do it immediately. There's this rule that if it takes less than 60 seconds, do it immediately. Don't push it off. So if it's like the silly things, right? Like you go up upstairs and there's something on the steps that you put there to take up with you. How many times you put it on the stairs and then you walk up the stairs three or four times and you don't, you're like, I'll take it up the next time I go. And I, I started practicing this rule. If it takes less than 60 seconds, do it right now. And it actually changed my life because I waste a lot more than 60 seconds on lots of other things like on my cell phone, right? So if I can just do this one small thing, so it's actually made my life much more focused, much more intentional. I get a lot more done, but I use that, I, I allowed that same concept to translate into my relationships. If it takes less than 60 seconds to check up on someone, to say, I love you, to, 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 to give a compliment, a validation, do it, don't wait. And the, the amount of times that I've done it and gotten the feedback, how did you know? How did you know that that's what I needed right now? Or it's just like, yeah, I don't need to know. I need to trust. And if someone or something pops into your mind, what does it cost you? I mean, let's face it. We live in 2022. People literally take their cell phones into the bathroom. So send that text while you're on the toilet. Like instead of scrolling face, I, I know it sounds really coarse and callous to say on a live <laughs> that people are going to be listening to, but let's face it, you're doing it anyway. So if you're taking your cell phone in, make that your designated time, make that your designated time to think about someone or to reach out to somebody. Um, it, it makes such a big difference. And there, there are a lot of wasted opportunities and a lot of wasted moments. Um, and really now is the only moment we have. Exactly. When it comes to healing, you meet people left and right that are on a journey seeking healing, seeking peace, seeking mending of broken heart. Um, I talk a little bit about in my book uh, because the whole process of Kintsugi clarified to me the process of healing. When I saw and I understood the art, I understood what it would take to heal my brokenness and therefore, and that everybody's because I went on that quest and I interviewed so many people and everybody had implemented the same 10 things and the acceptance of time and knowing how to use their time was vital in their journey. An interesting story was that I was, when I was searching about everything about Kintsugi, I went, when I saw the piece and I understood, you know, like I really connected with the visual, I started searching for a Kintsugi master uh, in the U.S., but I wanted a Japanese Kintsugi master, like a real Kintsugi master. And I found one, I found one in New York and he gives a course and it's once a week for a bunch of weeks. So I reached out to him and I said to him, can, you, can I come and stay with you two days and we'll do the whole course, you know, intensive but because I can't come once a week from Florida. And he smiled at me and he said, you don't understand the time in between. It is vital for the process of Kintsugi because you need the drying to be done a certain way for it to mend properly. And when he said that, I understood the part of doing a Kintsugi piece, that nothingness, that time that you just sit and wait and you just hope and you pray that all the work you did till now is going to stick and it's going to stay well. And then you're going to be able to continue with the process, continuing embellishing and adding the gold. And I understood that that crucial time is and how we sometimes don't understand that period of patience and its validity. I think that everybody says, oh, time heals, you know, somebody loses somebody and then say, with time, you're gonna feel better and with time. And what does that mean? Is it just the passing of the days? Do people expect that we're just going to forget what happened to us? And with distance of time, just the distance itself from the event that hurt us, we're going to be feeling better? 
I mean, everybody knows that our memory is 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 strong. I mean, trauma, PTSD. Everybody knows that people that go through trauma, they will experience and feel that pain and hurt in all kinds of ways. It's going to affect their physical bodies in all kinds of ways. So, what are you doing with this time, and how are you using it for healing? Well, there's so much I I have been wanting to say, like, as you're talking, I'm like, I hope I remember everything. <laughs> so the first thing I, I'm actually going to work a little backwards. And um, when you said everyone knows that when it comes to trauma, I actually wanted to say, actually, that's um, not a given, you know, because today trauma is a word that people talk about a lot. Everybody has an opinion on it. Everyone seems to know something about trauma. And that was not always the case. In fact, it wasn't even the case five years ago. And it definitely wasn't the case 10 years ago. Today, you have 13-year-old kids, like my daughter, who's like, oh my gosh, I'm traumatized. But And then, of course, they're bastardizing the term. But but I know that 12 years ago, we were dealing with something in our immediate family. And we were speaking to psychiatrists who were so quick to prescribe medication. And I kept insisting, no, I think there's an element of trauma here. And they wouldn't even listen to me. It was so quick to just go straight to chemo, you know, chemical interventions. Um, trauma wasn't even a, a word that was so um, so rec like recognized and accepted as it is today. And I'm so grateful when you can say everyone knows. And there is this belief that everyone knows because I think, thank God, today everyone does really know or have some sort of understanding about trauma. So I'm, I'm grateful to hear you say that and just reflect on how far we've come as a society that today people do know about trauma in ways that they didn't really understand or um, integrate before. Um, but about time. So I think, I think the, 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 the consensus about time is kind of what you mentioned, that as time passes, right, our memories, and, and that's where people mainly um, focus on, oh, when we say time is the healer, we think that it's the distance and the memories. And I have a little bit of a different, well, not a different, but an additional take to this, because I don't think you need me to talk about the distance, right? Because the distance can also sometimes be an unhealthy thing, because maybe sometimes we use time to just forget about things. And that's not healing. That's that's suppression or repression. And, and that's, that's um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, the word is at the tip of my tongue, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not there. That's, that's an illusion. Mm -hmm. um, I think where time really comes into play for me is nothing is an accident. So I know that a few days ago I had an appointment and um, it was kind of a last minute thing. And, um, and I told the person that, look, I have to be in class at 12 noon. So it's really, really tight. Can we, can we do this super tight? And he said, yes. And I drove out and of course I hit traffic and I was going to be there like, 10 minutes late, but we still had enough time. And then when I got there, his person, like the place that we were supposed to be in, the technician was stuck behind like a, a garbage truck. And we ended up starting about 40 minutes late. And he felt so guilty. And he says, I know you have to be in class. And I know, and I know, and I know. And maybe we should just cancel and you can turn around and go back home. And I said, actually, no, I don't think so. I think that there's an element of this needs to happen. And this is part of that process. Whatever we're trying to do, the fact that I was late, the technician was late and whatever's going on, I think that that is a part of this process and let's stay present for that. We will make sure that I get to my class when I need to get to my class. But from now until then, let's stay present and see what comes up. And it was such a magnificent experience, such a magnificent morning. The conversation that we had while waiting for the place to open, the where it led us, what we both gained from, from our time together was so beautiful. And this person texted me after and said, I actually have to sit with what you showed me, that level of presence that that it didn't flow our way or the way we thought we wanted it to flow. And yet it was such a it 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 was perfection. And you you trusted that by not needing it to be any other way. And that's really how I engage with time, because time isn't real. Time is a construct. It doesn't exist. The past is a memory. It does not exist. The future is a projection. It's a, it's a wish. It's a hope. It's a dream. It does not exist. We only have one time and that time is now. So when people are talking about time being the healer or how does time heal? For me, it is cultivating presence. 
It is when people say, but when will I be fixed? There is no such thing. The concept of when is, is, is a human construct that we've created when, just, just so that I can live my life by like a linear fashion, like I would like to know when to meet you, right? I would like to make sure that we both end up in the same place at the same time, which is why we agreed that this call starts at 8 p.m., right? But that's an agreement. That's a construct between two people. That's not reality. Reality is that the only time that exists is this moment. And when, when people are in a healing um, journey, let's say, right? Let's call it the journey. Um, the journey denotes uh, an expectation of a destination. There is no destination. And it's why the journey is the process. But I have to, I, 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 I've lost count of how many times I've actually told this to people. When are you going to know you're healed? There's no such thing. I'm not healed. I don't even know what healing means. There's no such thing. I'm on this journey of imperfection. I love being imperfect. I love just embracing all of my shadows. And this moment is all that I have. So I need to learn to love this moment. And it's, it's also, you know, let, let's trans, uh, transmute this for a second. I, I hear this a lot when people, with people struggling with their weight, right? So let, let's take the healing journey trauma out of it. Let's take weight. How many people say, well, I will love myself when I'm a size two. Until then, I'm going to abuse my body, uh, uh, like verbally abuse myself, mentally and emotionally abuse myself, starve myself, treat myself terribly, not buy myself anything pretty or any new clothing. I'm going to dress terribly. But when I am a size two, that is when I'm going to start loving myself. And then they become that size two. And they don't love themselves. They panic. They develop anxiety about, but what if I can't keep that size two? And it's just like, so what did you actually accomplish? You can't hate yourself into a version of yourself that you will love. And the same thing goes for healing. You can't, you can't tell yourself that I'm going to put my life on hold until I feel the way I want to feel or look the way I want to look. There is no, life is only right now. So you, no matter where you are in your journey, the, the concept of time for me is embrace this time. This is the only time you had. If you die tomorrow, can you make today the best possible day that there is, no matter where you're at in your journey? <laughs> <laughs> Don't hate yourself into the version that you will love. I have to write this down. Thank it's God. It's not mine. I actually stole it from the book. Right behind me, it's called yeah. "Women, Food, and God" by Janine Roth. It was a line that just stayed with me, and I was like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that," but I'm gonna give her the credit. Absolutely, it's fantastic, so powerful, and thank you for sharing. Um, there is only now, and now we are dealing with um, a society full of pain, dealing with tons of adver adversity in a in a time that in a time, in a period of time in history, right? Can you that, define time without saying the word time? <laughs> yes, right. That um, we are always escaping the now, right? We es we're, because we don't want to feel pain, right? We, mm -hmm. we don't want to feel the now. And so we take our phones or we play games or we, we do things to not deal with pain, with hurt, with brokenness. Um, so that time, that that now is being jumped over, ignored, not lived, not, not dealt, not used the proper way for you to achieve more joy. I mean, ultimately, we want to be happier. We want to feel more times of joy in our life. And I think that, I always say, that I think that the, we're here to improve as humans. We come to improve. That, that's the journey is a, a place and, and time that we go through to improve our lives and to improve the lives of others that we are connected to. Um, and we need to learn how to do, what to do with the time when, when, we, when we deal with pain. Um, I know that when I went through a tremendous, tremendous loss, uh, it was a loss that was different than a death. So I didn't, there was no book that gave me uh, the directions on how to heal from this, uh, from this loss, because it was loss of the living and I couldn't find anything on the subject. I decided to, so I wouldn't feel that pain 
that I would work very hard. I quit my career of 25 years and I became a fashion designer when I don't even love fashion. I don't care about clothing at all till today. So I did that to be busy because I didn't want to be in the now. And as long as we're trying to escape the, the now and that time that we have, right? Because you're hundred percent right. What is this time? The, the time is really now. That's the only time that there is. But if we don't learn how to sit in pain, and if we don't understand how it's okay to be and cry and to feel that pain and to feel brokenness, and it's part of the human experience, and it's the only way for us to really understand what joy is, is if we experience pain. If we don't understand how to go through that, immersed in that, we're all the time hiding and running away from the issue. So then what happens is that we're not using time to heal. We're not using the time, the now, in a way that tomorrow we will feel more joy. And um, I told many times for people that, that they have been here before, I'm sorry that I'm repeating the story, but I think it's a very important story is the day that I woke up to my journey, my own journey, is I was sitting across my husband, I was crying, I, I could feel the tears. I, I, till today, I feel where those tears fell on my cheek because they were so hard, so, so hot. And I'm sitting there feeling depressed, really understanding what all the advertisements for depression, when they show that caricature that can barely walk because I embodied that. that. My husband and I are sitting like this, and I told him, you know what, let's go to the beach. And I came to the beach. We, we arrived there. We could barely walk. We come to the shore, and I said to him, and everything that I said and everything that I did came from a higher power because it wasn't, wasn't planned. and Nobody told me to do it, and I don't know where it came from. Uh, but I told my husband, let's pick up shells from the ground, from the beach, and let's say to the shell, you are my disappointment in the people that were supposed to stand up for me and they didn't. And I threw that pain in the ocean and I took each shell and I described the pain that I was feeling and each one, we did it quietly. We told our pain and we threw it in the ocean and we started walking, barely walking on the beach. And I, and I told my husband the following, we are trying to fix the problem by ever each way calling this person, calling that person, mediators, trying to get assistance. But we weren't accepting that this is part of our journey. And I said to him, well, what if instead of asking for God, we believe in God. So instead of saying, God, help me out of this problem. What if we just say, God, give me strength during this time of challenge and and hardship that we have to go through we accept what you bring to us not that we're enjoying not that we're happy not that we are excited to go through it but i trust you and i i ask you to give me strength because right now i don't feel like i have the strength to do it and as we said that and we were saying these prayers those talking prayers we literally felt almost like a wind behind us and we picked up the speed and we walked faster. And that was the very beginning of my healing journey. And it was understanding that I couldn't walk around the problems that I had, but I had to go through it. And I would need to wake up every single day, know that this is my reality, live my now with that reality, and that I wouldn't be able to mask it by working so hard that I couldn't think and I couldn't cry because I was too busy to feel and, and mourn. So what do you think about um, how, how, because I want, I don't want just to inspire. I, I'm very dedicated to, so people, when they come out from a show, they have tools that they can implement, so specific techniques that they can say, you know what, tomorrow if I'm in a difficult situation, instead of just, you know, being on my phone or trying to ignore the pain that I'm feeling, what should I be doing to 
use the time the proper way in order for me to become more joyful? Well, there's a lot there. I think that I hear this expression a lot. Oh, I can't cry because if I cry, once I start, I'll never stop. Mm, I don't know if that's true. The body does not want to cry forever. And the body does know the body and the psyche know how to regulate what we feel that feeling of if I start, I might never stop because that's years and years of suppression that the body is then fighting. And that urge from the body, it feels overwhelming. And then we feel like, oh my God, I can't let that happen. So I need to push it back more. And the more we resist feeling our feelings, the stronger the power of our feelings actually are. And I have found that you can, you know, you're, you have to be brave enough to feel your feelings because if you're not going to, you'll never know joy when it comes, or you're not going to allow the space for joy to come. It's like what that thing I said before, if you're going to hate yourself into a size two, are you even going to know love by the time you're ready for it? You might not because you've become addicted to the hate. So when we become addicted to avoidant behaviors, then how are we ever going to know that we're healed if we're not present enough to be there, to bear witness to the change that's happening inside of us. So for me, practicing presence is a very, very big deal. And also not putting your life on hold. I, I find that people who go through, um, I don't want to say the word therapy as a generalization, because I don't mean therapy. I mean this, the, let's call it the healing journey, because it's a very new agey concept. As much as all of us are on a journey, I think that there are certain people who have made healing like their mission. And it's almost like there's nothing else for them other than that. And, and what I find is, is that as much as this is my life and as much as this is my work and, and it's my joy and my love, I also have a husband. I also have children. I also watch TV. Like I, I, I love watching TV. Like I think it's actually good for your soul. It's probably, it's like junk food for your mind, but it's also like good for you because you can't be busy with this all day in the negativity, in the, like there's a point where I just tell people throw away your journal. Just throw away your journal. You are not that important that you need to have every thought and every emotion and every like twist in your gut down on paper. No one's going to be reading it after you're dead. Honestly, are you sure people want, should be reading this after you're dead? Like, do you really want this out there? So, I mean, and of course, I'm not hating on journaling. I'm a big journaler myself. Well, I'm not. I used to be, but I believe in journaling myself. Um, I, I believe in taking the time for self-reflection, but also then put that away and go live your life, whatever that means. Go to a park, go on a walk, have a coffee date with your friend. I mean, honestly, today I took my son out just before this call and we went to a toy store and I bought him a board game. And he's like, you're gonna buy me a board game? Like, that's a lot of money. And I'm like, so what? We're gonna sit and we're gonna sit across the table from each other. We're gonna look each other in the eye and we're gonna play a board game. Otherwise, I'm gonna be on my phone and you're gonna be on my tablet and we are gonna miss the light, the life that we are having where I'm going to miss your entire childhood and you're going to miss me. Like, this is something that we need to have. We need to be living life. It is so important. So one of the, when you talk about, um, when you talk about practical tools, so um, one of the practical tools, tools that I love is just practice taking three deep breaths whenever you can. And three deep breaths, I mean exclusively three deep breaths. Put your cell phone down. Do not be doing other things. If you're standing at the pump and you're doing nothing else, you're just waiting for your car to fill up, just take that time and count your breaths. Just watch your breath go in through your nose or through your mouth, whatever you prefer. No right or wrong way to do it. Watch it go down into your belly and then watch it leave. And just do that. You're at the pump. Practice being present at the pump. If you watch people at the pump, all they're doing is texting or looking at their phones or talking on their phones. And it's just like, can you just be with your body for a couple of breaths? Most people can't. And if you can't be with a discomfort, I promise you, you will not recognize the joy when it comes. Um, the other thing that I tell people is the... I, and I, I, I just said this to... I, I just ran a workshop and I said it to the women on the workshop. I mean, you probably know this because you record videos, right? And then you upload them. So you work so hard to get your, your content together. First, first you write your script for your video, right? And you, and you think about the content and you, and you produce it and you make sure you look pretty on screen and you put on your makeup or whatever it is. And then you're sitting on the screen and you've got the video. Then you maybe even edit it and then you upload it. And then you watch that upload time and it says uploaded percentage. 
percentage, percentage, percentage. And then finally you're at like 94% and from 94 to 99, take like 30 minutes. Like that takes longer than the whole video itself. Right. And then it's uploaded and then it's buffering. And you're like, <laughs> are you serious? So you wait out the buffering and you're finally ready because the buffering's finished and you're ready to hit play on that video. And then it says, cannot play video because processing. And you're like, are you serious? And, and, and you're just, and at a certain point, you have to get up and walk away from your computer. Just go do something else, wash the dishes, take a walk, I don't know, have a bite to eat. Let the processing happen when you're not there. And then half an hour later, you walk back to your computer and guess what? That video is live and it's ready to go. And I tell people this all the time, healing is not linear. And most of healing happens behind the scenes and you're not aware of that. It's some, there, there are things you can do. You can go to therapy. You can do different kinds of facilitations, whether it's breath work or somatic work or hypnosis, or there's so many awesome modalities out there. But what I see is people jumping from modality to modality to modality, and there's no integration time and there is no processing time. And the processing is something that actually happens in the background. It happens when you walk away from your computer, you have no control over that. And that's what people don't have a hard time accepting. You actually have very little control over that part of your healing. Like you can step forward, there's a lot you can do, but then there's a lot you can't do. You have to allow for it to happen. And that's the part of healing that is not the doing part, but it's the being part. And that's where time comes in. You need to learn to be with that process because there's nothing you can do anymore. Right. And another thing that's really important is understanding that there is no set amount of time for a specific thing to heal or for you to feel better or for you to achieve a, a, a sense of joy for each person is different. There is no, you, you can't, there's no one that knows that can tell you in three days, you're going to be healed. Uh, it's the type of thing that you need to trust, surrender the process, be in the moment. Um, and I always say like that, it's so interesting when you see the whole um, uh, science behind creating habits and making sure that they stick, right? If you want to implement a new habit, you know that you have to do it consistently for a, a specific amount of time. There is arguments. I say go with 40, right? Stay for a long period of time because you need to, it takes a lot of, effort and your brain to adjust for that to become a habit. A habit is something that you do it already without thinking, right? It becomes part of the, your, the fiber of your being. Um, like somebody that drives home and doesn't realize that he arrived at home. The brain, there's part of the brain that it's processing on its own. You don't even realize that it's doing because it's so used to take that path. When, hap when when you wake up in the morning and you don't think three times that you need to brush your teeth, it's just a habit. You, you don't need, oh, did I brush my teeth? For sure I brushed my teeth. Like I don't have to think about it be because it's a habit. When somebody wants to start implementing good habits in their lives, there's a whole science behind it. And you have to keep repeating and keep repeating and doing it and doing it and just wait until this really sticks. And if you are all the time, did it stick? Did it become a habit? Did it? No. Should I, can I, should I stop today and see and check if it was already part of my being or if it's forced? You can't do that. You have to trust the process. Keep going until the day that it is going to become part of who you are, really, that, that it is ingrained in you. And I think that um, for me, a lot of what helped in my journey was choosing specific new habits that would allow me to be present in the moment, having a morning routine, having that my cup of coffee, that I go outside during that time, I talk to God, I looked, I watched my butterflies, you know, I, I, I am grateful, I, I say out loud or I journal if I want to, the things that I'm grateful for, and I do the things that I do. And you have to do it consistently until it's obviously you don't even feel that, that you're doing because it is part of who you are and you're not going to stop it even if you're on vacation. Um, the same time, the commitment to the time, the commitment to not, not give it a deadline, but just say it's going to happen. 
because I'm, I'm committed to feeling more joy. So I'm implementing things in my life that are going to bring me joy and then just go with the flow. Yeah. And um, I see someone actually asked in the comments a really good question. How do people know that they should stop thinking that, uh, that they should that they still need healing? It is. And that's when I got a lot because when you talk about this healing journey and then there is this implication, there's like this deadline that there isn't, you know, and then so people keep going on and on and they're jumping on and they keep jumping from from workshop to workshop or, or, or practitioner or, or, or modality and, and they're not, they themselves are not even sure what they're looking for. And that's what I challenge people. Like, how are you going to know that you found it? What is the it that you're looking for? And I, I don't have an answer. But I know for myself, and, and this does relate to the idea of time and presence, um, for me, the, the answer is the word yes. That whatever happens, can I say yes to that? Can I live a life in full flow without resistance? And I, I actually had this, <laughs> this funny story happen years ago in 2017. We were sitting together, a group of, of people that we were all like connected, but we didn't know know each other some of us knew each other better than others and we had all gotten together for an experience and halfway through the experience someone across the room who had just met me for the first time although we had a lot of mutual friends and he wanted to catch my attention for something and he he pointed to me and he actually didn't know my name so he couldn't call me and he called me by my husband's name he's like baruch's wife you know he's like i forgot your name what's your name flowy and of course the whole room started laughing and um and i i said you know close enough Close enough, close enough. And it stayed with me, even though it's been five years since that, since that moment. And, uh, and why it stayed with me was because I said, that is actually it. That's, that's what I aspire to. I aspire to that sense of flow. And I think that's what healing is. The, the healing is really the art of becoming whole. And it's embracing all that is, you know, it's, it's, it's embracing all the whole of life experience to be in flow with all of it. And I think what, what's happening is people are saying, I want this, but not that. So I don't want um, pain. I don't want frustration. I only want joy. I only want peace. I don't want to be 10 pounds overweight. I only want to be this size, right? I, I want this in relationship, but I don't want that. So I love this part of my husband, but I don't want, love that part of my husband. And that is like actually the complete opposite of healing. Healing is the ability to be with a whole picture and with Kintsugi as well. Right. The whole idea of Kintsugi is that we take all of the broken pieces and we say we can be with all of that brokenness to create something even more beautiful. We, we create a whole new picture of wholeness that doesn't pretend that we are healed. We are not healed. It doesn't pretend that we've never been broken. It doesn't erase our past. It's just the ability to be with all. So for me, it's a an experience of almost like radical acceptance, which does not mean that I'm I'm OK with everybody who hurt me, right? I, I still have passion and I still have a sense of justice and right and wrong, but I can accept every moment and I can say yes. So like I told you the other day, when things were running late and there was a little bit of anxiety in the back of my mind about being on time to class, I said, but what if, but what if I said yes? What if I said, this is probably intentional, like this is God's plan. What if I pretended that I can hold this? And it's amazing the adventures that come your way when you say yes. And I, I've actually, I take upon myself these times. So like I'm the time right now of like radical, I, um, I, for those re you know, viewers who don't know me, um, I just had a, a baby after 10 years. So there's like this 10 year gap where I was, I mean, I have older children, but for 10 years I was on a very passionate mission and I was, I was doing one, I was very focused. And then all of a sudden, there's like a big shift in my life and there's a moment of like, oh, I don't know where I'm headed next. And I said, well, what am I going to do right now? Well, what if I just said yes? What if I just said yes the next few months and just see what comes my way, different opportunities, just, just don't judge anything and say yes. And for me, I think that is the key to healing. Um, your, your ability to say yes to life. When we get hurt and, and we've gone, and a lot of us have gone through so much pain we develop this coping mechanism that is designed to do just one thing. I never want to feel pain again. That pain was so bad. I will literally do anything and everything, even very unhealthy behaviors, just so that I should never feel pain again. 
But when we block ourselves off from, yeah, we say we want to block ourselves off from pain, but what we are actually blocking ourselves off from is a huge chunk of life experience because we don't block ourselves off from pain. What we are blocking ourselves off from is the expectation and the possibility of pain. But that's only a possibility of pain. What if there was the possibility for joy there? But we're not taking that possibility because we're afraid. So when someone says, how do I know if I am healed, right? How do I know that I should stop looking? Well, do you have the ability to say yes to life? Do you have the ability to say yes, even if to, to something that might cause you pain? Do you have the ability to, to say, I can hold this? And, and that's what healing is. It isn't a moment of perfection. It's an ability to hold all of it, the perfect, the not perfect, the light, the dark, all of it. I love it so much. Um, it's so kintsugi, so it's so obviously I love it. Um, Sally, I have a question for you. You have lots of questions, but go with one. I, I have lots of questions. I'm here on, on a journey of trying to figure life out. Um, shame. Yeah. I, I feel, and I don't know if it is because I felt it or because when I speak to people, that's what, also what I hear, that a lot of the brokenness and the pain that people feel because of their adversities like a big weight of that is sh feeling shame, feeling alone, feeling punished, feeling that they were, um, um, you know, th that they're the only ones who had something so horrible happen to them, you know, that they were uh, picked for something so bad, uh, but, but feeling a lot of shame. And I think that a lot of the people that I speak to they feel that the moment that they start opening up and they become part of a group or either you know it could be a group online could be a group in person could be two three good friends that they open up and they share their experience it starts diminishing the pain so could it be that the shame is a huge factor in how painful the experience of the adversity is. It's funny that you brought this up because we agreed to talk about time, you know? And I'm like, oh, we just went there. And it, it's not actually funny, funny, because of course we went there. Um, but I've been actually contemplating shame a lot today because I'm getting ready to run an event next week. And part of my prep is I'm deciding what I want the theme of the event to be and the kind of stuff that we're discussing. And one of the elements that we are talking about obviously is going to be shame and you didn't know that. So, um, but of course you brought that up here. So the name of the event that I'm running in a week from now is called Belonging. And with the premise of, of belonging is that trauma is anything that takes us away from love, safety, and belonging. Those are the three uh, emotional needs of human beings. We need all three of them, love, safety, and belonging in order to, to thrive. And if you think about if you know whatever trauma you experienced, it took you away um, from one or all of, the, uh, all of them, or it, 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 it gave you the perception of being taken away, whether or not that was true, but you perceived being separate from love, safety, and or belonging. So I really took a deep dive into what is belonging because a lot of people talk about love. Uh, everyone seems to have an idea about love and what it means and how it feels and, and, and what's good love and what's bad love and codependent love and, and all of that. People talk a lot about um, safety, right? You're a safe person, you're not a safe person, I feel safe. And uh, just, I don't even wanna get into that whole uh, can of worms because I think also people are so, I mean, we've taken away people's resilience. Just people are so addicted to this misconception of like what they think safety is. And we've we've really destroyed people's resilience because they're not willing to take risks anymore. But let's go into the belonging piece because it's not really being spoken about a lot. Loneliness gets spoken about a lot. Shame gets spoken about a lot, but not belonging. And I think that belonging is an element. It's a foundational element for healing trauma. Um, and shame is, it keeps us from that. But in order to really understand shame, you have to understand what its opposite is, is belonging. And people tend to think that belonging is passive, that I need to fit in, that there's a group and I need to be accepted by the group. 
And that's a very harmful way of thinking because it leaves you feeling helpless. Like there's pretty much nothing you can do to belong because I need them to accept me. And there's always a me versus them. There's always an other and my belonging or my sense of belonging is dependent on the other, which is a total fabrication because you can do everything to fit in and still feel lonely. You can be the perfect person. And there are so many perfect people. We both heard from people like that who seem to have it all together and they still feel lonely. So what is the belonging piece and how does it really connect with shame? So if you look in, in grammar, in, in the English language, most of the words that start with be, like, like the be, the prefix, are verbs, right? Like to bequeath or to bestow is something that you do to another person. So to belong is an action. It's a verb. It's something that you do to others. It's not something that you passively wait for others to do to you. So we tend to think that there's a group and the group needs to accept us when really belonging is that I need to belong myself to a group. I need to walk over to the group and I need to say, hey, this is who I am and this is what I can contribute. In order to do that, you need to be different. You need to be unique. Because if you were the same as everybody else, what would actually entice a group to belong you? What would you actually be able to say to a group? This is what I have to offer you. How would you belong yourself? So you actually do need to be different and unique and, and have something very new to give a group in order to belong yourself. And the problem is that we, because we've changed it, because we've made belonging this passive thing, that I wait for a group to belong me, we think that we need to be just like them in order to be invited and belonged. So when we take our differences, which we are all different, right? We all have different faces and different blueprints, different fingerprints. We were meant to leave a different imprint onto the world. We become ashamed of our difference because we think that that difference blocks us from belonging. And that is where shame comes in. Anything that stands out, anything that's different, anything that's a little bit dark or that you're afraid of being judged by becomes your shame. So shame and belonging are complete opposites. But when you can own what makes you different, when you can own your shadows, when you can own your imperfections and you can say, because of all this, I offer, I belong myself, that's where truth link comes in. And it's flipping from a passive to an active role. And the way I experienced this myself was a lot of people who have heard me before, or Googled me or know a little bit about me, know that um, I started way back as a cancer survivor. And years ago, nobody said the word cancer in my community. It was, it was like, you didn't talk about illness. We, we are supposed to be perfect. And um, I was like, that doesn't work for me. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I don't know. I'm like a big mouth. I just, I just don't do that stuff well. And, and I just, I just believe in honesty and I believe in integrity. And I, and I kind of was like, it's not something that I did to myself. I didn't ask to have cancer. God gave it to me. So, and I believe in God, I think God's awesome. And I think his plan is awesome. So let's just get with the program. And I kept a diary at the time. It's actually, where is it? It should be sitting right here, somewhere right here. I kept a diary at the time. I'm going to grab it for you. Um, and I turned it into a book. It's called Miracle Ride. There it is, right there. Um, my, like the screen is flipped. I'm like, which way should I be putting it? And uh, I wrote I wrote my, my experiences in a diary that later became a, a, I didn't intend for it to be a published book, but it became a published book. And it just this year went into its seventh printing and it's, it's about 13 years old, went into its seventh printing, which is, and by the way, for those people who want to already Google the book, it's not written under my name. I did write it under a pen name. Where's the camera right there. It's written under Sippy Caton. Um, when I was younger, I thought it would be cool to have a pen name. I didn't, I, I don't anymore, but that's, mm -hmm. you would find it under that. And I also did this. Um, this is not published one day. Maybe I will. This was uh, the scrapbook. Am I like on screen? I don't know. This is a scrapbook that my mom made. We took pictures of everything that I had been through. There we go. Um, everything that I had been through. Let me show you my favorite picture in the entire book. Hold on. I have to find this. Well, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is me getting a blood transfusion right there. Oh, wow. And uh, I was posing with my blood. But there's an even better picture of when I shaved my head. It's my favorite picture. And I feel like I do need to show this on screen because that's the one that people are going to be talking about. Um, <laughs> there it is. This is my chemo cut when we shaved my head and we took pictures about, of, of everything. And one of the reasons that this book went into seven printings was because I had no shame in being me and saying, this is my story and this is what I learned. And this is how I can belong myself to the world. This is the gift. If I can eliminate my shame, 
if I can just get over my, because shame is ego. Shame is what, shame is your own ego trying to protect you from the, from the pain of not belonging. But it's a myth. It's a fabrication that was designed by your own subconscious. And if you can tell your shame, I get you. I get you're trying to protect you, protect me. But I have my own way of doing something. And I'm going to use my, my weirdness, my uniqueness, my story to belong myself to a community, to a world that can use what I have to offer. Well, my book just went into seven different things. That's what the world was waiting for. And I am not the only person who went through cancer. I am not the only person who had a story, but maybe I'm the only person or at the time that felt confident enough sharing my story. So that's, I feel, the, the role that shame plays. Um, we like to blame the outside world for shaming us. But again, we internalize that very, very well. The outside world does a lot of things. And you can decide to be a victim to what the outside world did to you. Or you can choose to see your own role in that. Do you believe in your shame? Do you believe the stories that your shame feeds you? And most of us do because it helps us to believe in our shame because it protects us from having to feel that hurt. But how long are you going to believe the story of your shame? How long are you going to let your shame keep you in a little box? When if you, if you step out of that shame, even a tiny bit, just let your voice be heard even a tiny bit. I mean, you and I see, I, I got past my ego. I got past my shame and my shyness to text you and look where we're at right now. Changing the world. Yeah. One conversation at a time. Exactly. I think that, first of all, you blew me away with this whole explanation. It made it so clear to me, this whole idea of belonging, how you said it. Really, this was a good practice for your next week. It was a good practice for my next week. <laughs> it was, but it was so, uh, so good because I think that the weight of the shame uh, doesn't allow us to use time in a way that is creating more opportunities for joy because you're sitting in your sorrow for, you know, imagining most of the time is imagining what other people are, would think about you. It's nothing is reality. And I also noticed that, yes, yeah, sometimes people even say things, people, some people do judge, they judge for three seconds, they move on to judge somebody else. Like no story is that great that stays on people's, you know, tip of their tongue for too long. Um, but we stay in that chain for a huge amount of time. But if we had the guts to come out and ask for help, share what you experience, share the process like you did with your book, first of all, the the most important thing that's going to happen is that you're going to help somebody else going through the exact same thing. And now you're going to take that pain, that, that brokenness and that devast devastation, and you're going to make it into kindness. And that in itself uh, is so healing. Yes. And I think that our inability to be with shame is that we have um, become addicted to this illusion of perfection. Now, um, I know, you know, I grew up religious, as you can tell, I, I am religious, I'm married to a rabbi, we, you know, I grew up with all the Torah uh, stories and concepts, and, and I use them as my role models. And Torah is full, of really embarrassing stories. And they mince no words. They have a lot of role models that have been through some pretty, pretty shameful encounters. And here we are, 1000s of years later, taking these very human people who have you know, misstepped and, and, and done some, some terrible things. And we study them and we talk about them. And there's a reason why our, every major religion, I mean, I'm, I'm only speaking for Judaism because that's where I grew up, but every major religion has key archetypes that have dealt with um, discrepancies and, 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 and these kinds of uh, crossing lines and, 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 and sins and whatever kind of behaviors. And, and our religions do not shy away from talking about these things because that's what makes us human. Humanity is full of flaws and imperfections and, and shadows and, and darkness and even evil. Like we're, we're full of that, right? So, so our shame really binds us to this illusion of perfection. And perfection is, is literally poison when it comes to healing because healing is about wholeness. It is not about perfection. I am not a perfect person. I don't pretend to be a perfect person. There was a time where 
I probably hoped, not I probably, I did hope that when I died, everybody in the world would have nice things to say about me. And um, quite a lot has, a water have, has passed under the bridge since then. And I have come to learn that there are probably, there not are probably, there are lots of people who have never even met me who dislike me. They don't like the shape of my face. They don't like my nose. They don't like the sound of my voice. They don't like what I have to say. They don't believe in what I have to say. They have already judged things that I've had to say. It, and it's like, I don't even know those people and they don't know me either. And then, you know, and then there are people who hate me only because I can't give them what they want. And it's like, what am I going to live my entire life? Like what attached to an illusion of perfection? It's not possible. It is not possible. And, you know, it's, it's just like the minute I, I was able to free myself from that illusion of needing to be perfect. I was healed. <laughs> okay. I'm not there yet. I'm still, I'm, a, I'm like, I say a recovering people pleaser, but all of a sudden I had so much more energy to actually do what I wanted to, to actually pursue my own joy instead of just the voices in my head. And, and, um, Brad Reedy, one of my favorite authors, he has a book called the audacity to be you. Is that also right behind me? It's a yellow book. I think, I don't know. Is it that one? I don't know. Um, he says, what other people think about you is none of your business. And to me, that was the antidote to shame. What other people think about you is none of your business, but this moment belongs to you. And this moment is your business. Don't let other people affect your moment. And, and whether they're in front of you or just in your head and shame is allowing other people to affect your moment and, and your space and time. So I'm not, I'm not perfect at this by far. I, I have a lot of work to do on myself. Um, but this is the one concept or one of the concepts that I'm really taking very seriously and working with continuously. I don't let other people's um, judgments or even my judgments on myself, I try not to let that get in the way of living the life I want to live. Incredible. Sally, we're, I could talk to you for a million You're hours. gonna do that thing again, right? Where you, where you trap me on live and get me to agree to come on another one. Well. <laughs> Okay, so that's a yes, I guess. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I got you before you could get me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you just one thing before we close, because I want to leave everybody with, um, with some, with, with homework, because I think that I want people to listen to this now and whenever it is, you know, over 1,300 people watched your previous show only on YouTube. Your show is also on Facebook. I didn't see how many views there were there, but I'm assuming by, by now 2,000 people watched that one show. So let's hope that 4,000 people at least are going to see this one. And I ask everybody to share it. But I want people to leave this show with, with uh, I want them to, to close the, the, the computer and before they go into whatever it is that they have to do into their lives, I want them to stop for five minutes and think about how they're going to use their time there now in a way that can get, get them closer to feeling joyful. And I, I want to emphasize something that you said, because I thought it's so simple and, and yet so great that you said, I also watch TV. You know, I also watch TV and I, I want people that are too preoccupied with healing that you can never um, get there if you're all the time checking, right? It happens and the result comes, like you said, with the video, right? You, you upload the video when you go to the kitchen, that's when, when it's there. So you don't have to be too preoccupied with the, with the healing process. You need to cry when you need to and feel the pain and, and be in the moment in the pain and in the joy and be there. You can distract yourself as long as it's in a healthy way. Consciously, like consciously yeah. distract yourself. Exactly. Um, but, but, you know, do take a few minutes to see what you can implement that is quick, that you can do in, in your day like the breathing, yeah. like, like saying, you know, I'll tell you one thing that I do when I'm feeling a little bit anxious, when I, when I'm trying to fall asleep and it's like, I don't know, the demons come out, you know, in that I'm so tired, I'm exhausted. It's so late. My head 
It's like, tonight I'm going to fall asleep in three seconds. I close my eyes and it's like 150 million things come. Did you do that? You didn't do that. You have to do this. Don't forget that. And that person pissed you off and this person. And then last week I had Eliza Bueller. We talked about forgiveness and she said, you know, all the people that you dislike, you're sleeping with them in your bed. And suddenly I'm thinking I'm, I'm this traitor. I have a hundred people in my, no, I don't, I don't dislike a hundred people, but I do. one is too much, right? I just but, like lots of people. <laughs> like, let's not pretend that I'm all light and love. I'm not a light and love and a lot of shadows. <laughs> but one thing that I do that helps me is I start counting, not sheep, I start counting blessings. I came to the conclusion, and forgive me for saying that, but the, the devil doesn't like when I do that. And when I start doing that, like when I go to number eight, I'm falling asleep. <laughs> you know, okay, okay, be quiet. I don't want to hear all the good things that happen to you. And I, I really look for the tiniest things. I don't say thank you for that I'm walking. Thank you that I'm talking. No, I say for the smallest, tiniest things because I search throughout the day for the blessings. Because I know that at night when I can't fall asleep, so I have material to be able to say those things. And I have to have a lot because God knows when I'm going to fall asleep. So I have to have this whole list of, of blessings that are sprinkled throughout, throughout my life. And I think that if we use our time instead of dealing in the shame and relieving and imagining things that, are un, that aren't true, that didn't happen, and, but imagining things and start fabricating stories. This could happen and that would happen and this would happen and they would hate me. Instead, switch the tone to start saying, you know what? My husband brought me a cup of coffee. I didn't even ask for it. That was so sweet. My child washed the dishes. That was so helpful. The other one emptied the dishwasher. Wow. You know, I don't have to bend now at the end of the day. Can I steal your kids for like a day? <laughs> <laughs> my kids are still at the point where they're leaving socks on the floor. <laughs> but, but, you know, little things like that happen. And I think that we have to, I think that that helps using the time in, to be in gratitude for the blessings that are sprinkled in our lives can change the tone of how, yeah. how we, you know, shame ourselves. Yeah, and when you talk about time, uh, I think also, like when I said before, like the watching TV or let yourself process, you know, walk away mm -hmm. for a few minutes. So, you know, I, I, you, can, you can call them distractions, but I, I call them conscious distractions mm -hmm. um, because otherwise you're really messing with the process. Right. If you're sitting at your computer and you're constantly refreshing, that video is not going to process any faster and you're just going to aggravate yourself. So using a conscious distraction to actually let that happen. So do a lot of art and find that thing. And if, you know, if, if art is not your thing, then fine. Just just listen to music. Um, I have a son who's a teenager and he listens to a lot of music. And sometimes it's very aggravating to watch him just veg. He does nothing. He can sit on the couch for hours with his ears plugged in. And he just listens and listens and listens. And it's very aggravating. You're like, go outside, play with the ball. And then I realized something. He needs to process. He does a lot during the day. And for him, just listening to music, there's a lot going on in his brain. We need that. We need them. We need, we need downtime. And I'm not even talking about self-care. Self-care is something completely different. And I'm not even going to go there because I am by far not good at self-care. But I'm talking about processing time. Take a nap, do some art, go to a concert, listen to music, eat a lunch, not a coffee. Coffee is not lunch. But uh, I know I say that out loud because I really do need to work on that myself. But that is one thing that I tell people. And, you know, just because you brought up shame, I'm going to bring this up here. I would challenge people. If you died today and all they remembered about you were all the things that you were ashamed of and that lived on in infamy for the next thousand years, they studied you and your secrets and your shame. Why would they be studying you? What would they be learning from your secrets and your shame? And that is the gift in your secret and in your shame. That is where your belonging comes in. That's where your healing thing comes in. What you, what you are so ashamed of, what you are so afraid people are going to find out about you, that is actually the lesson. That is actually the gift that you can bring the world. And nobody says that you have to go stand on the rooftops naked and just go expose yourself in front of everybody. 
but at least be brave enough to look your own shame in the eye. You don't have to talk about it with anybody else. But if you can stop hiding from yourself and say, well, what if my shame was my gift? What did I learn from this experience? And what would, you know, like if, if you were a biblical character and they were learning from you in a thousand years and your, and, and, and your discrepancies, what would they be learning? So take that and make that your gift to the world. And, and it's going to change the way you interact. It's going to, it's going to change your, your, your fears. You, you know, you're, instead of fearing making mistakes, you'll just make a lot more mistakes because you'll realize that that's where life experience comes from. And that's where the learning and that's where the blessings are. I don't love making mistakes. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm addicted to my shameful behaviors. Um, but it's something I tell myself and it's something that helps me, um, uh, and, and allows me to engage in life instead of hiding from it. And, and, and yes, and, and, and bringing it back to the time thing, it allows me to be present. I think shame also takes us away from presence. It doesn't only take us away from actions. It's I mean, my husband spends a lot of time doing silence retreats. He tries to do one every year. It's a 10 day silence retreat. Uh, and, um, he says the first three days are the hardest because the first three days where you can't run, what are you really should, sitting with your, your shame, your, your secrets, your fears. And uh, most people can't even survive the first three days, but if you can be with that, if you can be with yourself, if you can be present to everything within you, then beyond that is your gift. Beyond that is your light. And beyond that comes your ability to say yes to everything, to all of life. I can't add anything. Your voice needs to be the last one's heard. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm blown away. I hope you are too. Please share this video. And until next time, thank you so much. Thank you.